The following is a special presentation of MTN, the Montana Television Network. Live from Bozeman, this is Campaign 2012, the House Debate. And hello and good evening. We are pleased to welcome you to the MTN debate. I'm Donna Kelly with you this evening. What a pleasure to welcome our congressional candidates for this hour-long debate with us tonight. We're so pleased that you could make the time to be with us for this important time. It is our lone seat for the state of Montana, and it is important. You may have seen poll results that we showed you earlier this week in your race from the MSUB polling of those registered voters who were polled. 38% of folks are still undecided in your race. So people are still paying attention, and so we will be with you tonight for this hour. And then next Saturday, Senate candidates, and the Saturday following that, we will have the governor candidates, same time, 9 to 10 p.m. on those Saturdays. We have already gone over the rules and regulations with our audience. No booing and hissing and cheering and hollering or applause until we're all through so that we can let your candidates get their answers out and focus on the issues. We do have a clock. I can see it. Candidates can see it right here. And we have a timekeeper. We do have a format. We will follow that format, but we will not be so beholden to that format that we can't be a little flexible. If you're in the middle of good conversation and we are making points, feel free to carry on and we will adjust. That doesn't mean that one candidate will get six minutes and the other 32 seconds. We will try to keep track of that as well and keep it fair, obviously. But we will, if we were in good conversation, keep it going. All right, so we have a panel from our MTN stations around the state and we'll introduce you to them in just a moment or two. By virtue of the coin toss of who will get the first question tonight, Kim Gillen won that coin toss, and she is elected to take the first question. So everybody has issues. All of us in this room and all of you watching at home have issues that are important to you. We feel that the number one issue is a paycheck for folks. You want to be able to put food on the table and have a job. You are a state legislator. You have a lot of experience there, Kim. But how can you take that to play on a bigger stage and come back and take that and make results really to get Montana jobs. Great, thank you for the question. But first of all, thank you for the opportunity and great to be here. You know, during my legislative career and also in my career as a small business person promoting economic development, I've learned early, early on that if you're gonna create jobs, you need to make sure that you have a well-trained and educated workforce. And in Montana, that's really critical because 95% of our businesses hire less than, have less than 10 folks. So you need a well-trained and educated workforce. That means you, kids need to be able to afford to get that training. The other key element is that you need to have an infrastructure. It's important for our small businesses to have the roads, to have the broadband, to have the communication, and all those key tools. It's going on up right now in northeastern Montana with the Bakken. The key is, is to make sure that we have a business climate that will encourage job creation and job growth. I've done it in the legislature and in my job, I can do it in Washington, D.C. And Steve, you have a lot of business success. You have had a very successful career. How can you take that to Washington, though, when you got to call a lot of the shots and you got to tell people what to do? Maybe you can't tell other congressmen and women what to do as easily. How can you take that success, translate it, and make it into the economy and jobs for Montana? Sure. Well, I do have a little different resume as I run for this seat. Uh, I spent the last 28 years in the private sector. I'm a product here of the public education system here in Bozeman. Went to kindergarten through college, in fact, here. Walked to Longfellow School, and I'm a proud bobcat. But after uh, graduating from college, like many Montana kids, I had to leave the state to find a good high paying job. And over my 28 year private sector career, I'm proudest of my last 12 years where I got to come back to Bozeman and we were part of starting up a company that went from 100 employees to 1,100 employees, 1,000% 1 growth. So my experience is not through textbooks or serving in a legislature. My experience come from actually doing it every day, actually creating jobs, interviewing, making job offers, fighting through regulations, understanding how to balance a budget, understanding the risk reward equation every day and that'll help me and allow me to connect the dots quickly in Washington as we look at important decision and important policy here as it relates to getting this economy moving forward again. 
Thank you, candidates. And paying attention to the clock, they're doing a terrific job. All right, let's introduce you to our panel tonight. We are represented uh, with KBZK in Bozeman, KXLF in Butte, and KPAX in Missoula, and KAJ in Kalispell with Jill Valley. And KXLH in Helena, KRTV in Great Falls, Tim McGonigal. And from KTVQ in Billings, Janelle Slade. Jill, start us out with your follow, please. All right. Thank you so and much. That will go, let me tell you, that will go to, to Mr. Steve. Gaines first. Yes. That's right. Okay. This is from a viewer. We asked a lot of our viewers what they would like to know from the candidates. And this question reads, how can we expect to grow our economy and actually create jobs when our federal government owes trillions of dollars to others? Yeah, it, it's, it's a critical issue. In fact, uh, we face a $16 trillion debt. The debt clock just flipped over to $16 trillion. And we look at the debt to GDP ratios in our country today. For the first time, our debt now exceeds our gross domestic product. It's a huge issue. I'm a father of four children. In fact, three of my four kids are here with me tonight, along with my wife, Cindy. And it's about their future, about the uncertainty that this tremendous debt has placed on this economy and overall on our country. So it has to be addressed. It is, uh, we refer to it as generational theft. We are borrowing right now from the next generation to fund this generation. And we may in fact be on the cusp here of setting the next generation in worse position than our generation, which would kind of break that generational chain of the American dream. It's, a, it's of paramount importance. This issue gets addressed. We get moving on a glide path here of reducing the spending finding ways to grow the economy, increase tax revenues, not by raising taxes, but by creating more taxpayers. All right. You mean, yeah, it's your next. Would you like me to ask the question again or? Uh, no, I You got it? Okay. <laughs> Good job. You know, you're right. We do have to worry about the deficit. But at the same time, we need to make sure <laughs> that we continue to grow the economy, that we get people back to work. And as I shared before, we know that happens through investing in infrastructure and investing in our own uh, domestic uh, job creation here. We need to have incentives for job creation in the United States and not continue. Let's close a couple of those unfair loopholes that really subsidize people to ship jobs overseas instead of closing plants here. Let's open plants here and we can do it. There are many ways to do it, but the way not to do it is to support a budget plan that my opponent supports that will end Medicare and will actually result in the loss of jobs. It's basically not a workable plan. We need to work together, end the gridlock, and then get serious about how we plan our future in the United States and in Montana. Any panel follow-up? Okay, Tim, why don't you go ahead then, and this will go to Kim first. All right, Kim, uh, your opponent's campaign is promoting more jobs and less government, and I'd like to get your thoughts on that, uh, on that statement, especially the less government part. Well, thank you. You know, one of the things I'm really proud of is the 16 years that um, I served uh, the Billings community. And when I was in the legislature, I was really uh, sort of a no-nonsense legislature. And uh, people knew me for being someone who was very fiscally responsible. And they knew that I, would deli I had a proven track record of delivering results. And as I feel that Montanans are really concerned about results, balanced budgets, predictable and fair taxation, workforce development, in uh, investment in infrastructure. They're concerned about results and they're not concerned about rhetoric. We need a smart government, and we in Montana like to say that we can have control over the things that we do here. So yes, we need to have a smart government. We need to trim the waste and fraud in the federal government, and I'm the person to do it because I can work with Democrats and Republicans to get things done instead of maintaining the gridlock. Sure. Well, this probably is one of the differences between uh, Senator Gillen and myself in terms of what is the ultimate source of job creation and economic growth in this country. I believe strongly that it really comes from the people, from the private sector. It's got to be the fundamental engine that drives this economy. I don't believe that our government is going to bring the solutions here to fixing this economy. Rather, we're going to have to find ways to spend less in Washington, regulate less out here in Montana across our country, and tax less, allow job creators to have more dollars in their pockets so they'll step up in that risk-reward equation and take that very, uh, it's a, a risky step to send out an offer letter for a new employee. Anybody who's a job creator here knows that. It's a big responsibility when you're running small businesses. 
to uh, offer that job with the benefits and so forth and stand behind that payroll. And where we probably disagree here is I don't believe in the trickle-down government uh, solution. I believe it needs to come from the bottoms up here from the private sector leading our growth and ex expansion of this economy. Any follow-up panel? Uh, Steve, uh, are there any governmental programs or departments that, that you would like to see cut? Well, I would, um, uh, we have to step back. There's a couple things fundamentally we need to do to reform the way government is spending our federal government. Uh, number one, we need to put in place long-term structural reforms. And this is a difference from my um, opponent and myself, is we need, I believe, a balanced budget amendment. That won't fix next year's spending problems, but it starts putting structural reforms in place that insist that we don't spend more than we take in. Forty-nine states have it. Montana has it. Why didn't the federal government have that? And then across the board, we need to set limits and set targets of percent spending versus our GDP. Today we're about 24%. It's, a, it's, a, it's virtually a record high. We need to get back down to the 18 to 20% range, and we can do that by setting some glide paths, some targets here over the next seven to 10 years and start bending that spending curve combined with igniting the economy and generating more tax revenues because we're creating more jobs. Kim, any programs that you would like to add to or cut out? Well, I think we need to talk really quickly about Montana. 95% of our uh, businesses are small businesses, and they rely upon the infrastructure. And I like to give the example of uh, over in Lockwood. They had a problem with their sewer system. The Lockwood businesses and the homeowners could not afford that. So they did have to look to the federal government for some funding. So what we find that really works in Montana, what fills those potholes, what creates jobs, what grows small businesses, are what I like to call private-public partnerships. That's the reality of what we need in Montana. Janelle, you're up, and your first question goes to Mr. Daines. Steve, uh, my question has to do with not only the economy, but also the environment. As we all know, the Bakken is booming. New technology to find or produce oil is largely due to fracking technology that is relatively new with some uncertainty as to its long-term effects. Do you believe the current EPA rules in place are sufficient to protect our state's groundwater supply in areas where we are drilling and we will be dr drilling in the future? It's a great question. And uh, to frame the context of this, as a kid who grew up in Bozeman, I spent many, many days and weeks at times uh, backpacking across southwest Montana. So I have a great respect and appreciation for wilderness, for our forests and so forth. And in fact, I caught my first trout here about 100 yards from here in the East Gallatin. So I grew up embracing the quality of life that Montana has to offer. Unfortunately, we get into this argument about resource development and the environment, the extremes tend to come into play. And the extremes are become more of an either or type of debate versus a both and. As it relates to hydraulic fracking, um, hydraulic fracturing has been with us since 1947. It's a technology that's 65 years old. So we're not talking about a, really a new technology. It's a, it's a proven technology. And there are not documented cases of contamination of the aquifer from fracking fluids. Now having said that, it's important that we put the guidelines in place so it's managed responsibly. And I'm proud of the fact here in Montana, we've gotten ahead of the curve there. And the, uh, the Montana Board of oil and gas conservation has put regulations in place regulating and requiring disclosure of the fracking fluids so that the people of Montana can see what's going on on our state lands and on our private lands. Uh, as it relates to the federal government, I'd like to see the federal government not get involved in that. We, we don't need to have the EPA regulating fracking fluids. Let the states do it like we've done it. In fact, the problem with federal lands is that uh, permits on federal lands in Montana dropped from 220 in 2003 down to just 26 this year. Why is that? Because of the fear and the process of federal regulations, and that's why you're seeing the, the drilling going on in state and private lands. Kim? Well, I'd like to share a story. During this campaign, you go all over the state, and I had the fortune of spending a couple of days up in northeastern Montana, where uh, most of the potential activity for uh, oil and gas exploration will be. And you know, Mr. Daines is right that the Board of Oil and Gas in Montana has put out some uh, disclosure requirements for fracking. But a couple of the ranchers that I visited with, and, and they had the surface rights and not the mineral, they shared with me that they're okay with those regulations and they'll see how they work for now. But they are also concerned about 
their wells and their groundwaters, and that they would like to see more transparency. When it comes to federal lands, let's face it, those are federal lands, and they will always be subject to federal regulations. I think the concern that I hear from folks up in the Bakken is that the oil development is an opportunity, but it's also a challenge. And coming from Billings, which is an energy area, I know that I've always promoted responsible and balanced development, and I'm confident that that will happen in the northeast part of the state. Any follow-up panel? Okay, Jill, go ahead, and this goes to Kim to first. Kim. Right, and it's again, we're talking about the Bakken a little bit. The state has a role in assisting those eastern Montana towns that are becoming kind of overwhelmed by all the development there in the Bakken oil boom in terms of their infrastructure and the services. Suddenly there's this influx of people that weren't there before. Do you think the federal government has any responsibility in helping them deal with this exploding growth? And if so, where would that money come from? That's a great question. Um, my background in economic development has included working with communities that were going to be impacted by energy development. I did that in North Dakota and I did it in Colorado. And I think what's happening now is that people are trying to get a handle on whether it's going to, how many new roads they need, how many new schools, how do they have to improve their sewer and water. As we know in Montana, the state has some, fed, that has some state programs to help with infrastructure, but let's face it, when it comes to roads, that it's really the federal government and uh, the surface transportation bill that helps with those roads uh, construction here. So it's going to be a combination of state and federal and the private sector working together. And as I said, those private-public collaborations are one of the best things that we have going for us in Montana. Steve? I think it's important that we allow the state of Montana to drive the agenda that relates to the regulations we want in our state. Uh, when you think about the math and the equation as it relates to working with Washington, D.C., we have two senators and one member of Congress. So there's three in 535. I'd rather see this regulation discussion happen in the state of Montana, where we have 150 Montanans in Helena, where we have a Montana governor, a Montana attorney general, a Montana land board, as we work out the regulations. And this is where Senator Gillen and I probably have a disagreement in terms of fundamentally trying to move more of this to the states and less of this I'm here from Washington, D.C. and I'm here to help that we see uh, across the state of Montana. I think we'll get better regulations. I think we will have uh, more accelerated economic growth. In fact, the numbers in 1984, 126 million acres of federal lands were under lease for energy development. Today, it's 39 million acres, a decrease of 66%. If we could go back to the same levels of 1984 that would generate $785 billion of lease revenue over a 10-year period and in excess of a trillion dollars of additional tax revenue. And as we talk about economic growth, creating jobs, solving this deficit and debt problem in Washington, here is one great example where we don't need the federal government to get in the way, we need the federal government to help facilitate growth of our energy sector here and become deep independent of foreign sources of energy. All right, we have a question tonight that was taken from Billings that was recorded for you, and let's roll that, please. What is your uh, position uh, in Indian country for Montana's Native American population? What's your position for the Native American population? That goes to you first, Steve. Sure. Well, it's a good question. And anybody who has grown up in Montana understands that the, the Native, Native American culture here in Montana is an important part of who we are as a people. Uh, recently, I had the honor of uh, being in Browning, Montana, and met with Chief Earl Oldperson and the tribal leaders there of the Blackfeet tribe. Uh, he was chief for over 50 years. He's 84 years old. I want an honor to sit down at a table with uh, Mr. Oldperson and talk about what's important there in the, in the tribal community. Talk about the importance of the water compact there on the Blackfeet Reservation. But the reservations in the Indian country face numerous challenges. We know there's uh, severe economic challenges there. You don't have to go very far. You drive through our reservations in Montana, you can see it. Uh, you look at the health care challenges on the reservations, uh, you see the challenge we face in education. In fact, I was proud of the fact we had a couple members um, Native Americans join our team at Right Now Technologies. They got degrees at Montana State University and became significant contributors to our company right here in Bozeman, but yet still had their ties to their uh, 
their native culture there on the reservation. So here's what I would pledge to do. If I need to be a good listener, I will continue to ensure that the BIA and Indian Health Services are responsible to the tribal needs and be that advocate as the member of Congress that represents this entire state. Kim. Thank you. And thank you for that great question. I spent around 12 years of my economic development career working with uh, reservations across not only Montana, my first project was in Fort Peck a long time ago, but also in other parts. And what I really do is I, I value uh, and recognize tribal sovereignty. And when I'm elected, I will uh, work shoulder to shoulder to help uh, the Native American reservations with their economic development and job creation. But that's a great opportunity to go back to what Mr. Daines was just saying about the federal government role, less government, more jobs. He talked exclusively about regulations, but there's also the important issue of the investment that our federal government makes in Indian Health Services, those other programs that help create jobs on the reservation. So I think we need to, when we look at the issue of less government, more jobs, let's not distort it because there are federal dollars that do help our Native American reservations, and to me, those are very important and critical because Montana's economy will not improve unless we know that our folks on the reservations are doing well, and that will be a very key priority for me. All right, as you may have noticed, we've been going over a little bit of our time here, and that's taking up some of our follow-up time, but that's okay, and we'll continue that as we take a quick 90-second break and come back with more of the debate right here on your MTN station. Twenty seconds, twenty seconds to air, please. Welcome back to Campaign Twenty Twelve, the House Debate on MTN, the Montana Television Network. And welcome back. We are sure glad to have you along tonight on your MTN station as we have Steve Daines and Kim Dillon for our hour-long MTN debate. We have finished the first segment, and now we carry on. And Tim McGonigal will start us off again, and your first question goes to Kim, please. Thank you, Donna. And uh, Kim, uh, the Montana Air National Guard faces the possibility of losing its flight mission. In your opinion, how important is a flight mission to Montana, not just to those Guard members, those men and women, but to the entire state? Well, thank you, and that's a great question. National security is very important to all Americans and, of course, to Montanans. And the great thing is, is that our folks up in Great Falls play an important role in national security. Also, that operation is critical to the economy of Great Falls, not just the public sector, but the private sector. In fact, last week I met with some uh, private sector folks from the Chamber of Commerce who urged me to make sure that I would be a strong advocate for continuation, if not expansion, of Maelstrom. So you have my commitment that I will continue to promote what's going on in Great Falls. It's really a win-win for our national security and also for our economy and, of course, for those good-paying jobs that it creates and promotes in Great Falls. It's a great question. It becomes a personal question. My first cousin is an F-15 pilot. In fact, uh, he, he's a colonel now. 
And so I've watched his career, what it takes to uh, get to the level where he can fly one of those airplanes. And I think everybody someday would say, well, I sure like to fly F-15s versus do the job you do at a certain day. It's the dream job he has, but that's what he does. When we have these decisions in terms of relocating bases and relocating Air National Guard wings, it needs to be done under two criteria. One is, what is the right thing from a national security viewpoint? And two, what's the right thing from a fiduciary responsibility? And when you look at it from a national security viewpoint, and in terms of financial sensibility, the answer is those F-15s should stay right here in Montana. We've got wide open skies. You talk with the, uh, the leaders there with that wing. They've got wide open skies there across the highlands and so forth for the training missions. Why in the world would we take those jets and move them to California where you have crowded skies? Other than the fact politics gets in the way. And whoever's got maybe the, 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 the more important political leader pulls that wing away we need to stand up and say, let's do the right thing for our national security, do the right thing from a financial viewpoint. It's a very, very expensive proposition, multi-billion dollar move to move those F-15s out of the state of Montana. They need to stay right there in Great Falls and be part of protecting this nation. Janelle, go ahead, and your first question goes to Steve, please. Or did you have follow-up, Tim? Well, I, I guess uh, this one might be for Kim. It sounds like Steve sure. is in favor of keeping the F-15s and fighting for those F-15s. Uh, there's been some talk of bringing in C-130s. Uh, are you, Kim, in favor of keeping the F-15s or transitioning to the C-130s? Well, I, I think the important thing is, is that the Maelstrom Air Force Base is critical to the economy of Great Falls. So whether it's substituting uh, the current mission with another mission, it's not just a matter of substituting, but looking what has the capability and also looking to the long-term economic growth. I really am concerned about this constant switching around. I think that we have the developed infrastructure at Maelstrom to support the F-15s, and I would prefer to do that. However, I will, not, I will fight to make sure that we continue that strong presence uh, in Great Falls, and most importantly, that whatever goes on at that Air Force, that we invest in modernizing it so Great Falls can continue to become a critical part of our national security. And I think that's the most important criteria. Go ahead, yeah. Steve. Yeah. Yeah. Just to be clear, though, uh, the F-15s are not a maelstrom. Uh, the F-15s are up there uh, with the air wing up on the hill. Maelstrom is now uh, is used for ICBM protection. So they're really two different issues. The F-15s are not at Maelstrom. I like to say, though, when I was up in Great Falls, even though there is that distinction, when I was meeting with the folks from the Chamber of Commerce, they said, Kim, we like to look at the whole system because do you know that all of that military activity represents 43% of the Great Falls economy. So, uh, you know, I, I understand the differences, but they have a tendency to think of it all as one, particularly not only the public folks, but the private sector folks. All right, Janelle, you're up. It goes to Steve, Steve. first. Uh, Congress's approval rating is at an all time low. Many Americans express concern that our representatives are not getting things done. If elected, what are you going to do to restore faith in our system? It's a great question. Uh, the approval rating of Congress, oftentimes you'll see it between 8 and 13 percent. And the question is, who are those 8 to 13 percent who still approve? It's gotten to be such a mess back in Washington. I think ultimately it starts with personal integrity and what you bring as a human being to the political process. For the past 28 years in business, I've had to bring people together of varying views and so forth and come to consensus and move something forward here to get a result. I look back, though, at leaders we've had in our history. You go back to the days when Ronald Reagan was president, when Tip O'Neill was Speaker of the House. Now, those are two men who had very, very different political views and ideologies, and yet they came together and passed comprehensive tax reform. They came together during the day, and they would confront one another on policy, but at night they could go have a glass of whiskey together and maintain that personal relationship. That's a big part of what's missing in Washington. And you can talk to people I've worked with for 28 years. You can talk to Democratic legislators who will be willing to have a cup of coffee with me because they know they can have a conversation there that will be uh, in, 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 a, in a network of trust and integrity. And we need that back in Washington. Kim. Well, you know, I think that one of the biggest challenges we have in resolving the deficit or figuring out what kind of budget we're going to have is this whole issue of gridlock. And part of the gridlock stems from this attitude that it's my way or the highway. 
and I will share with you whether it's in the Billings community or in my 16 years in the Montana legislature that I worked with both Democrats and Republicans time and time again. In fact, the Democrats were only in the majority two out of the eight sessions, but that didn't stop me. But one of the ways to break the gridlock is to come with realistic solutions. And this uh, budget plan, the Ryan budget plan, as even Ronald Reagan's uh, budget director said, is a fairy tale. So we need to get away from these fairy tale or my way or the highway solutions and use someone like myself with a proven track record of solving problems to get things done. And that will be a major step in breaking the gridlock. I have a follow-up to that. If you win, you will go to Washington, D.C. as a freshman representative. How will you best serve our state even though you will not have very much power in Congress? Well, you know one thing, over the years, if you look back at history, Montana has had only one seat in the U.S. House, but that certainly hasn't stopped some of our great leaders like former Congressman Pat Williams from getting things done. And the thing is, it takes a person who has the track record, who knows how to work with Republicans and Democrats, who will walk across the aisle and say, hey, is there an opportunity to collaborate? And you can do that when you start from the middle and you listen to diverse opinions and you look at realistic budget plans. And I'll do that as a freshman. I'll use the experience I've had in my business and in the legislature in my community and as raising two teenagers to, uh, instead of closing doors and closing options, opening friendships and opening options to get things done in Washington. Steve, as a freshman congressman. Well, you think about it in life, it tends to work that way, doesn't it? You, you go to uh, Bozeman High, you start off as a freshman, and then you graduate, you go start at Montana State University as a freshman. It's the way life tends to work. And throughout my, my, both my uh, schooling career as well as my uh, professional career, I've always been one to be a quick start and a quick study and, and to move quickly in terms of getting results. And it, it, you've got to first earn the respect back there. And Senator Gill and I would, would agree, you've got to earn respect, not only within your own party and so forth, but earn the respect on both sides of the aisle. Being willing to, to venture out and say, I'm going to go have that dinner, that cup of coffee with somebody that perhaps other members of the party won't go have a cup of coffee with. And that is a way to accelerate uh, and stepping into leadership. I think second, too, is competency. It's important that we have leaders going back to Washington who won't have to study tax policy, uh, budgets in depth, because they come with that experience of working with it every day in terms of creating jobs, every day in terms of balancing budgets. And I think it provides an acceleration in that startup curve when you first hit the ground as that freshman. Where I know the first week they have to explain where the bathrooms are, and you work your way up from there. But I'm prepared to do that and look forward to rolling up my sleeves on January 3rd and getting to work for the people of Montana. Let's do a social media question. This is from uh, one of our Missoula viewers from online, perhaps Facebook. And they want to know how you can serve such a big, diverse state. Kim, it goes to you first. Well, great. As we like to joke, you don't run for Congress, you drive for Congress. And I've been all over this state. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's an opportunity to listen to folks. I think, you know, we need to, as I've been sharing this evening, I have a proven track record of getting things done, not just in the legislature, but in my own business and my workforce development, and most importantly, in my community. And the way to do it is not to go there with an attitude that it's my way or the highway, but to go there with a track record of bringing people together. And whether people are Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, or Independents, that's what I've always done and found where we can collaborate without compromising principles. So I'll continue to listen to Montanans as I have before. I'll use social media and everything. I'll be coming back here to visit. But more importantly, as I've always done, is that I'm always willing to listen to someone and see how their idea will fit in if I know it'll lead to solving a problem. Steve, one minute. And, uh, Senator Gillen and I agree. I, that was a good line about uh, you drive for Congress in Montana. Uh, as we say, you don't measure running for Congress in terms of oil changes as tire changes as you, as you travel around the state. In fact, to explain that to folks back in the Beltway, I think you have to tell them that you can put Washington, D.C. down in Alzada. You can put Chicago up in Yak. And that's the size of the, uh, the congressional district for the state of Montana. But my roots are five generations deep here in our state. I, I grew up here. I know the state well, but as a candidate now, I'm knowing it much, much better. 
And it's important that the, that the candidates and then the members get to all 56 counties. I'm the only member running in this race, the only candidate who has been to all 56 counties. Go to my website, stevedanes.com, and look at the map. You'll see little red dots, and you can mouse over and see pictures of when we visit every one of our counties. So it's important they represent the entire state because we know averages can be deceiving. We can look at our state unemployment rates below 7%, knowing that we've got the boom in the Bakken in sub-3% unemployment rates, but go up to northwest Montana, where I had dinner the other night with a couple who said, basically, we describe our part of the state as poverty with a view. Those are words that you don't know whether to laugh or cry when you hear that and the challenges we face up in that part of our state. But it's important to get out there and kick the tires in every corner of our state. All right, Jill, would you go ahead and your first question uh, for Steve? Yeah, and we're going international now regarding Iraq and Afghanistan, and this comes from a viewer who asks, in your estimation, what will those 6,000 dead soldiers have accomplished over the past 11 years and what, for what precise national interests? That's a sobering question, isn't it? Um, and I'm very, very proud of the men and women who have served our country bravely in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I've had family members. My F-15 first cousin pilot has been uh, had enemy radar locked on him as he's flown over Iraq. Uh, some of my neighbors have come home uh, with wounds that they didn't have when they left. And uh, it, it's what I'm proud of, though, is that we have uh, protected this country over uh, the last 10 years <laughs> from another terrorist attack on our soil. And that has not been by accident. It's because we've had we've preempted attacks by taking. Uh, the, taking our offense to them versus sitting back and allowing them to hit us back. But let me say this. It is time we wrap this up. I really believe the U.S. military's role is to go win the war and then to come back home. I don't believe our role is to be nation builders. The challenges there have been thousands of years old. We need to go back. We need to go defend our national security interests, win a war, and we need to come home. Kim. You know, as I've traveled around, I, I've talked with a, a lot of folks, in fact, one family that actually lost their young son in the war. And I am forever grateful for the fact that people would go over there and fight for my freedom. And I in no way want to diminish the uh, hard uh, fighting they've done. In fact, do you know that more Montanans volunteer for the armed services after 9-11 than any other state in the nation? So we as Montanans and every U.S. citizen needs to be forever grateful for the fighting that they did for us and protecting us. And as I said earlier, national security is a big issue. But let's face it, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have been all deficit spending. They've been expensive. And it's time to focus on nation building here in the United States. I think that uh, sometimes military intervention isn't always the the best first step that we need to have a, a calm hand of diplomacy and then as we go forward but folks in Montana tell me even the folks that are very proud of their children that served that it's time to focus on the United States and our domestic issues. If no follow-up Tim you're next and it will go to Kim first. Thanks Donna. Uh, Kim if you found yourself on the Congressional Committee investigating the death of the uh, US Ambassador to Libya and three others recently what questions would you have uh, on that committee? What questions would you have for the administration regarding that incident? That is a great question. I'm sure that's something that everyone in the room has pondered after they read the news report. Of course, we are concerned about national security. So you'd want to know whether all the protocols were being followed there. Were there any changes that put those folks in jeopardy? You know, it's... Uh, at, Sometimes as a parent, we're always trying to think ahead as to what can happen to our children. I'm sure many of you in the audience feel that same way when they started to drive. And I thought of that myself in a very simplistic term. What were protocols or what happened or what didn't happen that was supposed to happen? And sure, you want a, n a lot of numbers and statistics about accountability. But then the question I'd ask is that what could we do the next time to make sure that that didn't happen. Because the thing is, we need to think about the tragedy, but also about preventing it and solving the problem in the future. Let me, Steve, before you jump in, what do you think we could do then when you talk about accountability and what happened? How would you jump in there and say, here's what we could do differently so that we get some <coughs> answers in a timely fashion? 
That's a great question. The thing is, is that in all those installations, there's a chain of command. And so you want to make sure that the chain of command was in place, that people were following the existing uh, security regulations and find out where the breakdowns are. And one of the ways to do that is communication. And it's my understanding that somehow there was, might have been some potential communication breakdown not only within the complex, but between the complex and the folks outside. So making sure that you have the right protocols for communication. What isn't working, let's fix it. If it's working and we need improvements, let's go for that. Steve. Yeah, look, four Americans were murdered in cold blood at the Benghazi Consulate, including Ambassador Stevens and three other honorable Americans. This is not about have, you know, flying around the app in the, on the edge. We didn't cut to the chase around what happened that day. Let's remember this was the anniversary of 9-11. Let's remember that, that we had a Secretary of State and the Obama administration come out within 24 hours and say this was because of a YouTube video that incited this violence that resulted in the cold-blooded murder of these four Americans. There are some important questions to be asked, very pointed questions, regarding the intelligence that we knew and who know it when. And there, people need to be held accountable for, for, number one, making sure they told the truth to the American people during this very, very serious incident and didn't politicize it because we're four weeks away from an election. These are very, very important questions that relate to how the leadership of this country dealt with intelligence with a very, very important issue of four Americans killed in cold blood. Steve, do you think that foreign policy gets lost in the shuffle on the Americans sometimes unless it's a terrorist attack or unless it affects the price per gallon for gas? Well, it's um, uh, no, no doubt it, it, it's important that um, as we look at our intelligence and see what's going on around the, the world in places like Iran, you know, talk about the price of gas and so forth. The good news is in Iran at the moment that the sanctions are starting to have an effect. You know, we have terrorist leaders that are saying irrational things like wiping Israel off the map. The Iranian economy contracted by 0.9% this year. Inflation is running at 25% now in Iran on top of 21% last year. So sanctions are having an effect and we need to be using our diplomatic means and sanctions as the first weapons versus pulling any triggers and so forth. But it's a very, very hot issue. Let me just say this. I was disappointed in our president when Benjamin Netanyahu comes to meet with him and he was not willing to meet with our strongest ally in the Middle East, which is Israel. And we shouldn't stutter about that. We need to stand behind Israel. Kim, any follow-up that you'd like to, to do? Well, I'd like to go back to the original question about the Libya situation. I really think, too, we were asked, uh, the question is, what would you do, what kind of questions you would ask? To immediately jump to the conclusion that somehow politics was involved, I think is almost a disservice to our folks that in the Foreign Service, folks that are serving overseas. I think the better question to ask is, what went on? Were protocols followed? What, what, where was the breakdown? And not to assume that there was some kind of politics involved. As I talk to Montanans, they're tired of politics being the excuse for not getting things done. So let's talk about what happened in Libya, not what's happening in other areas, and uh, let's try to leave politics out of it because that's causing the gridlock that we have now in Washington. We need a new frame of mind. Can I say something on that though? There, there are four American families that the family members of those four murdered Americans are looking for answers. And part of leadership, and I agree, we don't want to politicize this. We want to call it out if it has been politicized. We just want to get the truth back in front of the American people. And these families are demanding answers. The American people should be demanding answers as well. You know, I don't think uh, the family should have to demand answers. I think they deserve answers. And uh, I would, maybe that would be one of my questions. If they're not getting the complete answers they need, what happens so they don't have that? But uh, I really think that... Uh, just find out what happened. We, we, wanna, we don't want to dishonor those folks by assuming that it was something political that caused their death. And I sure hope it didn't. If it did, I'd be the first to speak up. But let's find out what actually went happened and the truth first. Minute and a half break, and we're back with more right after this.
when we come out, because we're running a little short on time, and opportunity to ask each other a question. Would okay. Thirty seconds, please. Welcome back to Campaign 2012, the House Debate on MTN, the Montana Television Network. And welcome back. Now that we have some of the butterflies uh, out of our system with the debate, now the gloves come off and the candidates will ask each other a question, okay? And by virtue of a coin toss, Kim Gillen will go first and you will have the opportunity to ask the question, then you will answer for 60 seconds, and then you will have a follow-up opportunity and then you will have 30 seconds to answer that back, and then you may ask the question, and the same 60 and 30 applies. So, go right ahead. Great, thank you. And now is an opportunity to talk about something that a lot of Montanans have brought up to me over the last, uh, whatever, we've been on the campaign trail for a year. Um, Ronald Reagan, uh, unfortunately deceased president, and I know that you admire and respect him, his budget director recently called the same budget proposal that you support, the Ryan plan, he called it, quote unquote, a fairy tale that won't do anything to help our nation deal with the deficit. But what this budget will do that you support, it will end Medicare as we know it. And then thousands of Montana seniors, including military retirees, will be left without those guaranteed protections and at the mercy of insurance companies. So Steve, I'd like to know what are you going to say to those 170,000 Montana seniors and the 9,000 military retirees about why you support a budget that's going to end Medicare? Right. I'd be happy to. Uh, well, first of all, the, the premise uh, of the question isn't correct. The, the plan that is put on the table is not ending Medicare as we know it. The plan that's on the table, number one, is to ensure that existing seniors today, if you're 55 years old or older, will not be touched. Can I say that again? If you're 55 years old and older, it won't be touched. This is the problem, and this is what where Senator Gill and I would disagree, is that this is the demagoguery during an election to go scare the seniors for the sake of winning the election. So I have two grandmothers that are each 94 years old. They both rely on their Medicare. My grandmother in Billings has been in the same house for 48 years. She depends on her Medicare check. But the question is, what are we going to do to save this important safety net for the next generation? For my kids here at this table, and for my generation, and the generations to come. The Medicare trustees recently issued a report that says in 12 years, Medicare is broke. The trust fund does not have any more money in it. So it is now is the time to start addressing problem, this problem, and put solutions on the table that we can debate. The question I would ask is, what is the specific plan that Senator Gillen has that is going to save Medicare, other than they funded the President's Unaffordable Health Care Act with $716 billion of cuts from Medicare and putting Obamacare in, please be quiet, thank you, and, and put the insurance company, put the 15 unelected bureaucrats in charge of the health care systems in this country. Kim, you go ahead with your follow-up and then we'll get to his question. 
Thank you. First of all, we need to be clear, and I want to be perfectly clear that the budget plan that you support, Steve, does have an immediate and negative impact on, for seniors who are currently on Medicare. It will immediately increase the prices of prescription drugs. And for 15,000 Montana seniors, they're going to have to make a decision whether to pay for their heart medication or pay their electric bill. And then 120,000 seniors, they will no longer have their wellness benefits, things like colon colonoscopies and mammograms and other things that are considered part of preventative care that will help people down, uh, down in the future so they won't have exorbitant medical expenses. So we need to be clear. The budget plan that you are proposing does have an immediate impact on Medicare. Steve, yeah. your follow-up, and sure. then we'll do no, 30 here, seconds here, on that. Here's the immediate please. impact on Medicare is when the president, when faced with his uh, priorities when he, when he became president, the first two years he invested his political capital in moving Obamacare through Congress. In the midst of a troubled economy, when our first priority should have been how to get the economy back on track, he put through a bill with Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid that did not have any bipartisan support. In fact, it had bipartisan opposition. Not one Republican voted for it, but 34 Democrats voted against it. That took $716 billion out of Medicare. And the way they accomplished those, those, uh, those reductions in Medicare is by reducing payments to doctors and health care providers right now. Go spend some time chatting with hospitals and health care providers today. They're getting on the edge here in Montana of not being able to take more Medicare patients because they're cutting the reimbursements. So we're setting ourselves up for a short shortage of health care providers that aren't going to want to serve Medicare patients. That's got to be fixed so we can take care of our seniors, seniors like my grandma who lives in Billings who depends on her Medicare. Okay, and your question for Kim, please. Sure. Um, it's been said, you know, you're a native Montanan if you voted against the sales tax twice. Uh, Senator Gillen, in your career in politics, you voted five times to impose a sales tax on Montanans something they have overwhelmingly rejected on two different ballots, even if it's going to replace another tax. Why have you voted five times in favor of a sales tax when the people of Montana oppose a sales tax? Well, thank you for that question, Steve. And I'm glad to have an opportunity to talk about that. You know, I'm proud of the 16 years that I represented uh, the good folks in uh, Billings. And I was a very strong champion of not only economic development, to, but to make sure that we had tax fairness. So there, over my 16 years, there are lots of uh, votes there. And I know that I worked with both Republicans and Democrats to make sure that we didn't, we had tax fairness and we didn't increase taxes on homeowners. We made sure that senior citizens could stay in their homes. And one of the biggest concerns that I've heard over the years are the challenges of property tax. So working with Republicans and Democrats, I try to promote tax fairness. Quick follow-up. We are starting to run low on time, and we want to get your closing comments in next. So quick follow-up. Sure. So you voted for a sales tax, and I, my property taxes haven't, seen, haven't gone down. So it's, it's just, uh, would, you still, would you support a sales tax moving forward? Steve, great question. I do not support a sales tax moving forward. But I did carry some legislation for the Chamber of Commerce that would have helped communities that have a lot of tourism, much like Whitefish and Red Lodge have, if the local government wanted to ask the voters about a resort tax. Thank you both very much. We are running down on time a little bit, so we'll move up our closing comments. And also by virtue of a coin toss this evening, once again, Kim Gillen will go first, and we'll have to pay attention to the clock. They each have two minutes. Two minutes for closing, or do they have a minute and a half? 90 seconds. Okay, 90 seconds you'll each have. And so, Kim, you will go first, and there's your clock. Great, thank you. Good evening. Th thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you very much. You know, this, this election is about uh, a clear choice. And one thing that we didn't get to chat about much tonight is the fact that we need to send someone to Washington who's going to be able to break the gridlock, who actually has experience working with Republicans and Democrats. 
who's going to listen to Montanans and who's going to go there not with the typical gridlock attitude, it has to be my way or the highway. And I share that because my opponent does support a budget plan, has endorsed a budget plan that we know will end Medicare. It will also cut important services to Native Americans. It will also hurt uh, families of uh, the military and will cut defense and will deinvest in transportation those things that we know are critical to the economy. So instead, send me, who has a track record of working with both sides, who's a problem solver, who will not do business as usual, but will be a strong voice for Montana by listening to the diversity in Montana, by working for the diversity in Montana, and delivering, and not signing pledges or signing onto policies that we know from the beginning simply won't work for Montana and won't solve problems. Steve, there's your clock. A minute and a half for your right. closing comments, you please. Thank you, and thank you, Senator Gillen. And uh, I, I've been getting a lot of feedback in the campaign trail. But Montanans are appreciative of the fact that this race is not shaping up like that governor's race and that Senate race. There's a lot more civility here, and I appreciate that, Senator Gillen, uh, in terms of the way this campaign is being conducted. But let me try to help paint the contrast here between uh, uh, Senator Gillen and myself in this very important race. As I said earlier, I support a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution, federal budget. Senator Gillen opposes that. Uh, I've said I'm not going to raise taxes, saying that it is a spending problem in Washington. It's, it's not a tax problem. She's raised tax over 50 times in her career in the Montana legislature. I've said that I uh, uh, support repealing Obamacare. She supports the president's, what we call it, Unaffordable Health Care Act. And lastly, very important for a lot of Montanans, the NRA has given me their endorsement. I'm a lifelong hunter here in Montana, supporting the Second Amendment. And uh, Senator Gillen received the lowest rating of any statewide candidate as relates to the NRA rating uh, in this election cycle. But don't listen just to those, uh, those ratings. Go look at the Montana Chamber of Commerce, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the NFIB, the, the largest uh, small business organization here in America who have, who have endorsed my campaign, as well as her hometown newspaper, the Billings Gazette, and the Bozeman Chronicle have endorsed my campaign, which I'm grateful for that. At the end of the day, as important as all these issues are, this is a fundamental question about the future of America. My great-great-grandma came from Norway and homesteaded up by Conrad, and she left Europe. She was looking for freedom, freedom of faith and freedom of economic growth. And we don't want to return back to that path of Europe. This is about going back to the path of prosperity in America through more jobs and less government. Thank you very much. So we've been a little bit flexible on our time, as you know, through the evening. And you did such a great job on your comments, or your closing comments. We find ourselves with just a little bit more time. So I'm trying to think if we can sneak in another quick question. If, Janelle, if you could sneak in your Farm Bill question for them. We only have two minutes before we start our 10 o'clock news, so we'll have to be quick on our toes. Janelle. Okay, there's a Farm Bill sitting in the House right now. Will you vote for it and why? Steve. Yes. <laughs> and the reason why, well... I'll vote for the bill that came out of the Senate. We've got to get it through the House. There's gridlock right now in Washington. The Farm Bill is, was $993 billion in 2008. They've reduced it to $970 billion. So it's smaller than it was four years ago. They've eliminated three different subsidies. They've consolidated 23 agencies into 13, different, 13 programs. They've done a good job of making it more efficient. It's time to pass the Farm Bill and help out Montana farmers. Kim. Kim. You know, Montana farmers are about to plant their winter wheat, and they're pretty upset that there is not a farm bill. And unfortunately, it's because of the gridlock. And what I offer is someone who has experience in balancing budgets, working with both sides, and can break through the gridlock with realistic programs. Of course, I'll support it. I'll support other initiatives that we need, like jobs, economy, to get this great nation in Montana back on track. But the most important thing is we need a heck of a lot more of my Montana common sense in Washington than more of this do it my way only uh, approach. That's what I offer and the Farm Bill will be one of many initiatives that I'll get to work on immediately and roll up my sleeves. 
Excellent. We wished to hear from you this evening, and I think we heard a lot of good information from you. As we mentioned before at the top, 38% of voters in that MSUB poll still undecided on your race. So we hope that this hour has been well spent with the voters. We have about 15 seconds to close, so we want to thank you so much for making the time with us. Thank you, folks, for coming. Thanks for watching at home. Our MTN News is next at 10 o'clock, and we'll see you next Saturday with the Senate candidates. Thanks for watching.